the Third Street Gallery at 610 South Third Street in Philadelphia. Um, today, our current show is um, Thank You for Being a Friend, Artists and Their Companions, where the artists have invited a friend to exhibit with them. Um, I'm Patricia Aronsall. I'm the uh, director of the gallery. We have several gallery members here who will be talking and hanging out. Um, and my friend that I invited was, is Claire Robinson. But I'm very excited because while well, I invited her to the show as a friend, she is now an official member of the gallery. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Yay. So I've always been intrigued by Claire's work. Um, I, I find it, I find her work, um, it has almost a serenity to it. Um, while some people might say it's isolating, it isn't. It's more um, you contemplative. Want, you want me to help? Yes, please, please. <laughs> jump in. Talk about your work. Well, I, I, I never thought of it as um, serene. I, it is a bit, uh, I do feel it is a little isolated because I, I take pictures from my perspective and sort of alone. You know, I don't like a lot of people around me. It's something that I appreciate, um, but it's, it's calmness for me. So, but I think we have a mutual attraction of our photography because we both like lines and architectural type mm -hmm. of uh, photography, which I think the, um, our co-exhibit here as I as a member, I'm now a new member and as a friend, uh, really see the, how close in yeah. the types of photographs that we take. And I love it, I absolutely love it. Thank you. Yeah, because like, um, here, like the sneakers, um, there's that sort of day is done, I'm home, life is good, the door is shut. I can relax, you know, kind of thing. Um, and even the same with the staircase, there's that peacefulness, the serenity. It's not an isolation, it's more of a, a chosen kind of environment. Um, it's, not isola it's not isolation in the sad, I'm, you know, almost like, was it Hockney, you know, uh, was all about that. Um, it isn't that at all, it's this sense of serenity, the sense of calm. I'm with my thoughts, and life is good because of that. And yes, and of course, again, the, you know, the lines in both the staircase and of course in the, oh, please explain the, and then there were legs. I, when Claire and I were meeting <laughs> about what pieces, I, when she put that up, I said, that's in. I don't care what else you choose, that's in. Because I just absolutely love that piece. So why don't you explain that? Well, the legs are, um essentially sort of my find just walking around my neighborhood. My neighbor is the gardener and he has a lot of found art on his property. And just walking around, this is his shed and there just happened to be legs hanging off the shed. And I thought it was great. Uh, I looked at it in color, I looked at it in black and white, but the, again, the black and white spoke to me because of the lines and the, just the movement of the lines, the tree branches and the shadows. Uh, but this is, uh, this is found art. This is the <laughs> bottom of a crucifix that I'm not sure where he picked up, but it just has a, what is this doing here <laughs> type of look to it. And I thought it was just, just great. Well, I think that's the joy of that one. It is so unexpected. You know, it's, it's that element of surprise. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it's like, as you say, what is this and why is it here? You know, and just begs to be thought about and looked at more and more. The fact that it's a crucifixion, <laughs> and I get cuts of how the legs are, I never thought about that. I just thought about Whose thinks of those and how do they get them? Yes, yes. And I love how the shadow on the wall and the shadow on the thighs. Mm. I shouldn't have mentioned what they actually were, but I should just ask that question. Yeah. Because some people do guess and other people don't. 
Don't. It's funny because when Claire asked me, I knew straight away, but I blame that on 16 years of Catholic education. Yeah. <laughs> and it really is only the legs. The yeah. rest of it's. And part of that is interesting too. It can't, it just looks like it drops out of the shadow. Mm -hmm. There's no information about where the rest of it is. It's, it's very confusing. A little eerie, uh, but I like that. Good. I like the little. Right. Yeah, the, the strangeness <laughs> of it all. Yeah. In fact, actually, when I put that up on Instagram, um, an artist friend in, Eng in England wrote, it's really kind of eerie and creepy, but isn't that what good art is about? <laughs> <laughs> I have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, um, the other one I also, I mean, I picked, okay, so I picked that one straight away and sneakers, I think, was my second choice for you. Um, and again, because I said it has that wonderful serenity, um, aloneness in a good way, aloneness in the I'm content, I'm with myself. Um, and you chose for me, and I, I'm going to ask you why you like, you you immediately chose the top piece suspension, and this piece, which is um, column and arc. I think I. I love geometrics, I love patterns, and um, I actually love the circles uh, that are sort of built into this, and with both of them. But the upper one alone, if you just took it without the figure, it wouldn't have the same impact. And I think the figure just sort of brings attention. Um, it brings your eye a little bit away from the pattern, but at the same time, it emphasizes the pattern. Because you sort of, again, what's going on here? <laughs> what's happening? Um, how, how did that figure get in there? So yeah. it, it is, you know, it makes you ask questions. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, Jim, you'll love this idea of this piece. Um, that is actually the son of a friend of mine in England. We were at Kew Gardens, uh, I don't even want to guess how many years ago. Let's put it this way, Luke started secondary school this year, so this was a while ago. Um, but at Kew Garden, they have this thing, whole thing on education of honeybees and the importance of them as pollinators, etc. And they have this huge man-made beehive for, you know, I mean, it's a big sculpture actually, that you can climb up and into. Um, I think that, gosh, it must stand at least six stories. It's pretty high up. And it was a blazing hot day, and it was humid. And Luke and his sister and, and was, wanted to go up, and their mom was going with them. And I said, OK, the OAP is going to sit down here, because it's too hot for me to climb all those stairs. And anyway, uh, so they went on up. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard this calling of my name, and I looked up. And there was Luke. It's actually a plexiglass floor. And there was Luke actually splayed out on the floor. Uh, I happened to be in a perfect position to capture that moment because two seconds later it was gone yeah. <laughs> as kids. But one of the things um, I'm really interested in my photography is structure. Um, how does structure shape but not determine behavior and interactions with it? Yeah. And one of the things I'm really interested in is how people are playful in structure. And that's, I think, a prime example of how people will take a structure and be very playful with it. Um, this piece, uh, the second piece, that's actually out at the Brandywine River Museum. Um, and uh, I just, that skylight with, in the stairwell, um, just oh, really, stairwell. yeah, okay. it's, actually, it's actually the circular, um, it's a big circular hallway. And, uh, you know, and there's a skylight over it. Um, and that's what really drew me to that. And again, like you said, you put yeah. it in black and white and it's so much, yeah. it's so different. I like the curve juxt juxtaposed to the straight, straight line. Yeah. Because um, you have the solid straight on one side, dominating one side, and the curve, two curves actually mm -hmm. um, dominating yeah. the other side. That's, that's really great. And almost soften that linear, yeah. that very powerful linear. Yeah. yeah. And then this other piece of yours, um, again, what I loved was just that the whole linear 
um, both horizontals and verticals going up this, what's essentially a handicap rampway to a train station, isn't it? Well, this is, this is repeated at a lot of the, the suburban train stations. Mm -hmm. And starting, this is Allen's Lane train station. And actually, you see this at a lot of train stations, but I was particularly struck by just including those zigzags as well as the bench. Um, but right at the bottom, I wanted to include yeah. the, the only thing that has a little bit of color, which is the yellow stripe that mm -hmm. says, watch the gap. Um, so, but I... <laughs> After taking this picture, when I took the train, it's like, oh, there's, that station has one, too. Oh, that other station has one, too. And they were built very similarly, but I really, I really love the lines in this. Yeah, so do I. And I just love the Watch the Gap. <laughs> you know, it's just so great. Um, I, I, I sort of, I love black and white because it brings out the patterns without uh, distracting you with the colors, and that's essentially uh, what black and white does for a photograph. But the um, I love color too. My father was a amateur photographer, and back then it, it was almost you know I, everything was black and white. So I sort of like to look at things. How would this look in black and white? But I appreciate that there are definitely um, things that, that look better than color. Mm -hmm. And I, I, both of us have some color. Yeah, we actually have some color pieces in the back if you want to look at them yeah. later. Yeah, because and I'm the same way. It's like I really let the photograph determine what it needs to be because there's some that, you know, the color really is. Uh, there's some that go both ways, so I'll do them both ways. There was the artist in Lisbon at the Barnes Museum, mm -hmm. and he had pieces that were in process. He did the human figures and mm -hmm. such. And I, this really helped my photography because photography is a, essentially looking at light and shadow. Yeah. yeah. But he, he started by just putting all the shadows in. Oh, interesting. Before he filled in with the colors and that really fascinated me because that is the basis of how we see things. Yeah, and yeah. It helped me to sort of look at what I was photographing in terms of the light and shadow. Yeah, because it really is that sort of analytic looking as opposed to just taking in the whole. Yeah, you know, yeah. At the moment, then you start breaking it down. It's like, okay, well, what, you know, how is this? Um, how's the light reflecting on that? And how is it, you know, yeah. this is, yeah, this is in shadows and how the dynamics of the two together to form the whole thing, yeah. Not, not that I necessarily go through all that every time I take a picture, but... It, yeah, but it is sort of... It helps, too. Yeah, it does. So, huh? I guess that's us. I Thank you very is. much. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>
probably like about 20. Yeah, I guess so. We had been drawing together and started different drawing groups. And um, my work is really informed by the figure. Um, as you can see on both of these parts, um, the figure is primary to me. And um, I used to only do two dimensions, and then I started to do um, three dimensions, which totally blew me away. Um, the fact that you can go all the way around something, it's kind of like first I think about the form, and then I get to use it as kind of a blank canvas. Um, yeah, most of them, the heads come off because <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I don't know why I think it, that's the only part I ever made without a head on it. And I like the fact that, um, that there's a head on it. It's kind of like a presence that does not happen otherwise. You know, it's kind of boring, right? Without the head. So that's why I end up putting the head on. Okay? Okay. Okay, good. You also draw into your pieces after you build them. I do. That, or I, um, if you have, I don't know if there's any people who make ceramics, but I have figured out that oftentimes if you go through something on the surface, then it's kind of a waste of time. Because um, I don't always, sometimes I get this too, the clay itself is very lovely, but I always like come up close as a texture on this, and I always like to do something to it. So, um, so besides concentrating on the importance of the form, which I definitely do, and I just love the feeling that it goes all the way around. Every single time it flips me out that in these two dimensions, you know, it's like Henry pulled the veil away from um, from what I always thought I was about, which was two dimensions. My pieces got trapped between two dimensions and three dimensions, and I was actually going to take these off the wall and let you hold them. They are not delicate, but it might give you an idea of what it is to actually see them up close, and you can just pass them around. If you drop it, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> Because I think it's kind of cool to hold them and to see what's going on. What, what happened with these is that I had been drawing for years and years and years in watercolor or pencil, and, and I really wanted something to come off of the page. I was, I was frustrated with just the page. So what I wanted was a page that had dimension. So um, this is very light clay that I actually would love to give you all a piece of, but I'm not sure if I'll start a revolution if I do that. But um, it's really like having a page with your drawing coming off of it. And I've always really loved that in between place. I feel like it speaks more. I think somehow if you hold it, it makes more sense. So these are called bas relief. And they're low relief. And they're my solution to wanting to have something dimensional in my drawing group. So I found this clay that travels really well. And actually, I bought some. <laughs> Well, because I think it's really hard. Now, this is very clean. Okay, don't get it all over you because we don't have any sinks. But it's very don't clean eat stuff. It. Don't eat it. <laughs> Mary has strong feelings about that. But it'll give you an idea. I think somewhere between. Cool. And it's very clean. This stuff. So don't. 
and you can play with this, but it won't get you dirty because it's not, it's not water-based clay. I mean, it's not a, a clay that you need to fire. It's, a, it's paper clay. It air dries, which is wonderful. Now, when Mary puts her pieces in the kiln, they become permanent. If I put mine in the kiln, they would be burned away. Okay, because they're not, it's not firing clay. So Mary would like to know if anybody has any questions about either of our work, or if you have any questions about the quotes that we gave out. <laughs> or if you want to share a quote. Yeah. Actually, I have a question. When we were hanging the pieces, What, what, what makes it paper clay? What makes it paper clay? Okay, that's a really good question. I don't make this clay. I actually buy this clay this way. And all I can tell you is that they, the reason it's so light is because in some way or another there's, air, there's paper that's incorporated into it. And it also makes it quite durable when it dries. So that even though it's not fired, pretty much if you drop these on the floor they're okay. Not always, but... <laughs> Mary, I was going to ask you, do you um, preform your, okay. Yeah, everybody loves me, because I don't know where I'm going to do something, and it changes, like, you know, I'll get to a certain place, and I'll think, oh, that's really ugly, and then I can shift it till I get to the way I want it. It's very weird that I go in the a preconceived idea of what I'm going to do. Uh -huh. Mary, when you're doing a pot like that, are you conceiving of the pot first and then and then the design on it? Totally. I'm more interested in the form than I am in the actual um, drawing and then the decoration, which I consider that to be decorative, happens afterwards. And I don't know if you can see it from there, but I think the incredible thing about this part is the clay, like the fact that it's so speckled. I know, it's so cool. It, and it's really kind of amazing. It has nothing to do with me, it just the kind of clay that it is, which I have now learned after about 10 years, seem to matter. And it's like I forgot to think about that. Did that answer your question? Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody have a fabulous quote they want to share with us? Oh, good. This is something that I never thought about, but, it, but it's absolutely true from Hanish Kapoor. Oh, I love him. I, I love him too. I think I understand something about space. I think it is the job of a sculptor, that the job of a sculptor is spatial as much as it has to do with form. I think, it's, I think that's absolutely true. In my, uh, to my way of thinking, form is something that occupies space. Therefore, uh, <clears throat> in some ways, a sculpture is engineering a point in space as much as it is creating a form. Totally. Yes. Yeah. It's just splicing. Anybody else have one that was interesting or, or shot or you didn't understand it? <laughs> There's one quote that I don't know if anyone got that Rodin said, Rodin, who is the guy that makes all the sculptures that makes these incredible drawings. <laughs> H O L E and a lump. Thank you. Because I think I read it wrong the first time I read it. Oh, okay. So I was thinking it was the hole and the lump, but that okay. isn't what it is. Okay. It's the hole and the lump. <laughs> yeah, because that's kind of the other part about space and form 
this frugal dance, you see something so pedestrian as a hole and a lump is like really true, even though it's so basic, I think. Sculpture is something you bump into when you back up to look at a painting. Yeah, we, had, we had to include that. <laughs> It's such a great quote because it kind of denies the importance of sculpture and totally focuses on painting, which I always appreciated. I think I still appreciate it, even though I don't want anyone to back into it. <laughs> but I do really love two dimensions. I also think it's a way of discovery. Because you don't think about it until you bump into it and you bump yeah. into it and say, oh! <laughs> because in the dark there are no drawings, but there is sculpture. Yes. And it's kind of important to remember. <laughs> I think it brings us back to the space and form that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, it occupies the space and it is the form. And yeah, and it displaces space, space right. where it is. Right. Just like us, just like, just like yes. people. That's another reason that I think I love the figure because I'm a figure. And so when I draw, I'm thinking about, you know, me taking the pose of the figure. And Hannah and I talked about this, but the figure is as important as a landscape or a still like because it represents both of those things and drawing it helps you to put the pieces together and to understand the puzzle of, of representation. That makes sense? Yeah, no. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, making any art is um, a process of you making a problem and then you solving the problem according to the rules that you have constructed. And it seems absurd, but that no matter what you're making, that is true. It's true of writing music. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, exactly. You make up a problem and you have to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the delight of making the work, I think. Anybody else have well, anything? Yeah, thinking about the space and uh, form. It's not like, in, like we were talking about in photography, the light and the shadow. But even when you think about music, the sound and the silence. Especially so, the silence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that, that, that tension between the things, you know, which of course makes great art. <coughs> and the silence is almost like the space. You don't really think about that, but it's really important. I guess the fish would they think about space. <laughs> yeah.